This house is cursed. They were all godless here. All. They used to bring their women to this house. Brazen, lolling creatures with their silks and satins. Oh, they fill this house with laughter and sin. Laughter and sin. Wicked, blasphemous men with their painted women. They reveled in the joys of fleshly love. Oh, I can still, still hear the echoes of the past. Oh, what memories! This is the emergency podcast system. This is not a test. Movies are bombing all over the country. They are posing as movies you already know. They may already be in your theaters, your neighbor's home, or even your own. Do not panic. Specialists have been dispatched. They will help you identify these pretenders and defend you against this invasion of the remake. Please stand by for further instructions. Welcome to the Invasion of the Remake podcast. I'm your host, Jason Bishop, and this week we are doing Haunted Honeymoon, a Gene Wilder movie from 1986, an award-winning movie from 1986. (laughs) Which award would that be, Jason? Well, thank you for asking, Trish. It would be (laughs) Worst Actress Razzie Award to Dom DeLuise. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, um, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, not, Hello, Sam. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, this this sucker was written and directed by Gene Wilder, co-written with Terrence Marsh. Budgeted at $13 million. Mm-hmm. Grossed about $8 million. Mm-hmm. But it only ran one week. Because terrible reviews. One more week, they could have at least broke even. Yeah, I know. I know. Right? <laughs> you know? They probably would have got close to breaking. Like even. that's the thing. Even with a bad review, people were they would have gone for the same reason I went to see it. They had Gene Wilder and Gilda Radner together on screen. Yeah, and for the Don third, Louise for the and third and last yeah. time, because yeah. this was Gilda Radner's last, last role before she passed away in 1989. Gene Wilder, Gilda Radner, Dom DeLuise, Jonathan Price, looking very young. Um, He's good at this. Yeah, yeah, Brian Pringle, Peter Vaughn, Eve Ferret, Paul L. Smith, Jim Carter, Joe Ross, Roger Aston Griffiths, and Anne Way. Mm-hmm. No slouches on nope. any of these no, people. No, not at all. I mean, this is a mystery thriller comedy thing? Well, it's yeah. those old house movies that were becoming movie. back into vogue at that time. Yeah, Clue. With a bit of comedy. Clue had already Clue. come out. Clue. Rocky Horror was okay. yeah. becoming a cult film at that point. Yeah. And that's where I felt they were trying to accomplish with this movie, especially when they added in those the, the, the musical numbers. Yeah. yeah. It felt like they were trying mm-hmm. to... I actually like the musical numbers. Yeah, and so I yeah. did I. I think... The, I Gilda mean, Radner, by the way, when reassessing from that, I'm like, what a classy actress that would have had a hell of a career if, yeah. if cancer hadn't taken her so amazing. young. amazing. She was. Yeah, I mean, I have no act. complaints about the performances in this movie at all like, from anybody. Even Dom DeLuise was, he, mm-hmm. was you could, he was eating up the scenery, but he was just having fun. Yeah. yeah. No, my, my issue was that it was just really shitty directing. Yeah, well... And it was this totally was, all over the place. This would be problem. why Gene Wilder never directed again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, because it was... I, I'm sorry, Gene, but this was just bad. Yeah. Well, it's weird. With a story, you could tell he had a love for, like, those old horror movie kind of creepy, chilling, but you could have a little comedy in it. But it just wasn't strong yeah. enough, and it was tonally all over the place. Yeah, I liked the the throwback to old-time radio. Oh, I enjoyed mm-hmm. that, and yeah. I would keep that. Yeah. Now, we decided to do this because Gene Wilder had passed away, but he passed away while we were doing our horror month, and I didn't really want to bump that. Mm-hmm. So this is we're doing a couple of tribute episodes to the wonderful talent that was Gene Wilder, and... No disrespect to Gene, this was definitely not one of the better ones. But oh, I'd say this is probably got, the worst film he did. Yeah, yeah, but it's got so many interesting elements to it that 
you know, it's a bad movie that is remakeable. Yeah. Oh, for sure. With some, because it has some really interesting conceits to it. But it's also one of my, like, it's one of those ones that's so bad, I still enjoy it. Like, yeah. I can still watch it, and it's still, it's a good, you know, you're you're kind of down, you don't want to watch anything too challenging. It's, I'm a no on that one. I, I think I'm good. This, this I just may like Gilda be, Radner and Gene Wilder. This will be, I do too. And but. they've got two other movies together that I will gladly watch before I rewatch this one. I do like seeing them together on screen, but mm-hmm. I don't want to watch this movie again. I'd rather go, you know, watch Young Frankenstein or something. See, Young, Young Frankenstein was better. I didn't like Woman in Red. I didn't. Yeah. No, I, I thought did. it was just... I didn't either, honestly. Uh, see, I... I enjoyed it when I saw it. I have not seen it in 15, maybe 20 years, so it may not stand up. I'm a little, but, yeah, I'm a little more open to the pairings with um, Richard Pryor. I love the Richard Pryor. I quite liked those. Gene Wilder pairings. Mm-hmm. They had such great chemistry. Yeah, it was really tough for me to pick a movie for, for this particular episode, and we all, we every one of us had a different choice of Gene Wilder movie we wanted to do. Mm-hmm as a remake so i kind of took it to my clientele and the first one got backed up with trish so <laughs> <laughs> that's the one i went with because <laughs> i was like oh it's wednesday and i haven't picked one yet and oh this is so hard well this is the thing we're talking about you guys were saying like to be fair you, you had these ones that you loved mm-hmm. like how much did you really want to remake them i mean yeah. could you recapture the magic of gene wilder and richard pryor yeah, and when you and I were doing the Abbott Costello thing, we talk about classic comedy duos. Mm-hmm. You know, that's lightning in a bottle, and sometimes you just can't recapture that by mashing two people together that have no chemistry. So there were two unique talents on this planet that, honestly, after after Richard passed, Gene didn't do too much else. No, no he really didn't. Because he'd already lost one partner in Gilda, and... He lost another great partner with Richard Pryor. So, well, when Richard Pryor, I, um, before he passed, he, he well, was confined in a wheelchair. Yeah, so he wasn't, the long illness. Yeah. yeah, I have to look, but Dean Wilder, I don't think did much after See No Evil, Hear No Evil, which was one of the ones on yeah. our list. That was the one I wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was mostly doing kind of like guest spots and stuff. I think he was on Will and Grace for a few episodes. Yeah, no, he he did turn and up here and there, but he there was a short TV series he did. Yeah, he just wasn't the features actor anymore. And we haven't seen much of him in a while before his passing because I, I think he was slowly declining mentally. So, Well, yeah, I think it was it Alzheimer's. Yeah, I think he was heading towards Alzheimer's. I don't know if he got full-blown Alzheimer's, but there was some dementia problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's why he dropped out of the public eye, too. He didn't want people to see him like that. Yeah, well, and, you know, that's when you start seeing older actors start just quietly, go quietly into retirement. And it's not a case of... They're declining into dementia or Alzheimer's, but they are having trouble remembering their mm-hmm. lines and things like that. And they don't just, have the energy to be on set for 12, 14 yeah, hours a day anymore. So, and yeah. I, I totally get that. I mean, there's some actors who just have a retarded amount of energy. Betty White. Yeah. <laughs> and 91 still going, but... Um, still think she's a Highlander. Yeah, crazy. But That's the only reason she can still keep going. She's yeah. taken the energy of other people. She has the energy of all of the Golden Girls. Yeah, but you know it's a rarity. I mean, you gotta you gotta think that you know they mm-hmm. they're gonna want to retire at some point. Yeah, well, yeah, George I mean, Burns went for a long time. Too, oh, George though. George pretty much performed right up to his passing. I mean, he made it to one hundred, and I think Betty Betty might make it to one hundred as oh, well. Yeah, the way yeah. she's going, and I think she'll still be working right up until they make her stop Mm -hmm. yeah something about comedy is um really healthy for for people's longevity bob hope too he made it to close to 100 well it is as long as you can not be one of those people sort of plagued by some of the mental illness that happens well yeah i mean you can you have a longevity in comedy as long as you can be mentally healthy yeah it, it does uh it's therapeutic if you can get it out on the mic, I suppose. There are mm-hmm. some people who are never could quite uh, conquer their demons. And uh, we've, we've lost a few not that long ago. Mm-hmm. So, oh, terrible. on that happy note, <laughs> yeah. uh, to this movie. Yeah. Um, yes, not that this will be much happier to talk about because yeah. it's so terrible. <laughs> it's, but you know, but there's like, like you say, there's something there to be done. Oh, there's no yeah. question that it, that the the conceits and the concept of the film, like the, the, there's the core a concept, is love for for the idea. Yeah, yeah. 
Gene Wilder is a uh, an actor f- on radio back in mm-hmm. the old. Did, did we even get a year on this? But I'm guessing I'm about mid 30s. Yeah, mid, yeah, late 20s, mid 30s. Yeah, think, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah. or even the even the 40s. I yeah, think yeah you radio still was had radio. still really big in the 40s. Once once TV kind of kicked in, the radio started going away, but it was still pretty big into the 40s. Yeah. I mean, we still have radio dramas, but. It's more bigger in England than it is here. True. We're starting to see them resurface as podcasts. Now. And there's a few, yeah. there's a few that do podcasts. There's, I think there's one in New York where they do like the oldie timey ones, like mm-hmm. with Lovecraft and everything else, like the very over. Yeah, well, there's ones. there's radio there's uh, radio dramas of the old Twilight Zone episodes out there now, and mm-hmm. I've listened to quite a few of them. They're really good. So they're they're far more recent, but. At the same time, it was a bit repeat because they were of yeah. the episodes, so that kind of material is already out there. But yeah, and there's like some old Canadian ones too, yeah. like some old CBC ones that they used yeah. to do. Oh, that some zombie podcast thing. In the '90s, they had some for some reason that there was a small resurgence. Then it's amazing. Mm-hmm. I think it sort of loops back. I think we'll be seeing maybe some coming up because I think there's a love for like there's good writing that is required when you do an audio versus a visual yeah. medium because you have to make sure that people are kind of yeah. creating the world in their it's minds. It's still a very big medium in England and I wind up ordering a bunch of CDs and yeah. stuff from England because there's so much of it out there. You're not really a name actor out there until you've done stuff like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the reason that they continue to be popular is because there is a, a very... I and mean, it's a larger audience than people realize of, of people who are creative and they, they, they like being able to visualize their own, it on their own with mm-hmm. the assistance of the dialogue. Mm-hmm. Right? I, I, mean, that's, I think that's what makes them work. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, yeah. I get to continue the adventures of uh, my favorite doctors from Doctor Who as audios. Nice. So. Oh, and then I've I've been going back into like my old catalog of stuff. There's a, a TV, like a, sorry, a radio series called Cabin Pressure. That has Benedict Cumberbatch before Benedict Cumberbatch became the Benedict Cumberbatch. See, that's awesome, yeah. And he's doing comedy, and he's this like put that. upon pilot called Martin, where he's like cowardly and not that like not that good at his job, and he's amazing at it. He's so funny. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we we've got Gene Wilder as Larry Abbott and Gilda Radner as Vicky Pearl. They are engaged to be married, and they are also the stars of a radio program. But its name escapes me. But the episode, it's honeymoon. no, the episode, the Radio uh, Mystery uh, Theater. Oh, so it's something right. like that, yeah. And the episode that they were recording, recording at the story, beginning yeah. of the film is called Haunted Honeymoon. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. So there is actually no honeymoon in this movie. Just, yeah. just to be clear. Yeah, so so they are borrowing the title from a 1930s movie. 1940. 1940s, I'm sorry. 1940s movie, but it's not a remake. Yeah. So let's be clear on that. It is not a remake. But to be fair, Haunted Pre-Wedding is not really a good title for a film. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> haunted Engagement, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. But, but not, well, Haunted it, Engagement just yeah. sounds like it's trying to be an action film. Yeah. <laughs> Haunted Engagement starring Sylvester Stallone <laughs> and The Rock as Vicky <laughs> and Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> as, as Aunt Kate look at us the ghosts <laughs> one of you is a, I can't do Sylvester Stallone <laughs> one of you is a werewolf <laughs> that was pretty good <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I might just scrap my whole casting now. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> well, fuck. <laughs> that's that's way better than what I came up with. That's better than what I came up with, yeah, too. Mine, I don't know. I don't know. I still like my cast, but yeah. I... And that's been uh, Invasion of the Remake. The remake. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're rethinking this whole thing. <laughs> we just did the end. So, yeah, they're, they're recording. They're they're. they're finished recording at the beginning of this movie they finished the recording and they're going to go off to their uh, oh, wedding before but the end of the we, recording yeah but but the, this is where we establish that Larry has some emotional triggers mm-hmm. <laughs> that make him stare off in the distance and ask um, about his tie ask about his tie awkwardly I don't know that's his way of dealing with fear how's my tie <laughs> is my tie straight well Tell no me my tie straight. it's <laughs> because it goes back to like the reveal earlier as to what happened right before the thing, terrible thing happened, where mm-hmm. he's being admonished for not having his tie straight, and it kept getting twisted. So he goes back to, like, is my tie straight? Is my tie straight? Because if his tie's straight, then something bad's going to happen, I think. Yeah. 
No, he'd, he'd ask, is my tie straight? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, but is my tie straight? Yeah, yeah it's straight. straight. Swear to God that my tie yeah. is straight. <laughs> A little bit too much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, are you going to kill me now? The audio effects guy is like looking like, I, I just said it was straight. This is so weird. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's triggered by storms and the storm storms sounds. and wind. Storms and wind. And, uh, yeah, he, he does a bit of an bit, on-air meltdown. Yeah. On-air meltdown, a little rational, but I, I don't know. He's, they, they are a big star. Like they, they break before their final bit of recording. So this is like, I guess a commercial break or something. And all these reporters yeah. come rushing in and asking questions and he manages to hold it together for the most part. Mm-hmm. But, uh, near the very end, Vic, Vicky Gilda Radner, she's the one that kind of keeps him on track. Mm hmm. She's the calming influence in him. Yeah. She's well, she's both the trigger and the calming influence, you sort of find out. Yes. Because like he's just he's been becoming more unhinged recently since they got engaged. Yeah. So he's almost he's almost in, in peril of losing his job on this hit radio show. Yeah, they are really at their wits' end, but at the same time, he's a huge star. So mm-hmm. you can't really yeah, you but I don't really know. It was the him. old 1940s. Then again, Maybe not, they were just more disposable. Yeah, I guess. I mean, we need another voice. It's not a face. Mm-hmm. So You can do that. Yeah. The plan is to get married at Aunt Kate's old dark house. Where Her he grew up. A very gothic mansion. Yeah. A yeah. very gothic mansion where he grew up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love oh, that house. Oh, before the opening, we have the awkward pan across the house. <laughs> And this lady falling through the window, and then the hair falls off. Not a lady. No. But there's a knife in his, her, this, his back. This very deep voice, and it's Francis Jr., yeah. who says, it's not what you, you think. think. And I'm like, well, if that doesn't set this whole movie up, I don't know what does. And then it keeps panning. Then it stops. Well, it's kind of what you think. <laughs> but not totally what you think. And, and then actually, he dies. That opening yeah. is, uh, actually gave me a little bit of hope for the movie. I'm like, I love I that too. opening. I like the opening, too. Yeah. It doesn't pay off as well as you, you'd hope. but That's the thing. In some of this movie, there's lots of little bits I really love. Like them as standalone comedy pieces mm-hmm. do kind of work. But sometimes they seem like they're a little bit shoehorned in to try and make well, them happen. It, you know, sometimes I feel like they're trying to be serious and then not serious like sometimes it's almost farcical yeah. and other times not so much it, it it really has a tough time figuring out what it wants to be yes i think that was part of my issue with it and honestly there were too many people in it yeah i agree um, i would have knocked off some of that cast just to add to body count <laughs> yeah they mm-hmm. fit out the herd and yeah. simple out the simple out the cast a bit yeah because there were so many characters in there and they, they introduced them and then they don't really do anything Oh, yeah, like the ex-girlfriend. Like, I didn't even bother casting Sylvia. Yeah. Well, I was see, because she was there to create tension between Larry and Vicky. Yeah, right? mm-hmm. and but that they, was... They handled it very well. Yeah, although Gild, Gilda's uh, final scene with her was pretty good. And then so good. The way she kind of handles that, and then it's... You never really see Sylvia again after that. But. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah. like, like his cousin Susan and, and her husband Montenegro. You, you've cast a magician, and then the only kind of magical thing you see is when he first comes to the door, and then it's done. Right? Yeah, and well, it just stands around the flowers. Not, it isn't actually the only during magical the musical scene, thing. But, yeah, it is sorry. a scene, but I mm-hmm. kind of took it that part of what he is doing is all the illusions yes. are what he's there to yeah. do. Yeah, that mongoloid walking down the wall. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. and but again, not really explained because he was there and he just kind of glowers in the background for the most part. Yeah, and that's right. the problem. They don't set it up, and it take they even takes a little bit to tell you he's a magician. Yeah. So well, and they sort of skate over, and this is what I bring up as more a more important plot point. Where Aunt Kate, great Aunt Kate, has made Larry the sole heir to her fortune. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you don't if find he, out until the end, really. No, no. That no, was no. right that's, at the beginning. That's at the beginning, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. That's um, actually before Larry even arrives. Yeah, before he even arrives, right at the beginning. So, but if he dies, then they all share it equally. Then it goes so back to the original, yeah, the yeah. original will. See, I would kind of change that. I would still make him the sole heir, have them kind of do it equally, but also have a thing where, like you say... I would keep like I would keep some characters, but only just to be knocked off. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I would keep them there just to be knocked off. I want them to be a fight. For, yeah. Like, the inheritance. So, so now you've got some of the relations who want to knock off Larry to guarantee their part of the inheritance, and and then uh, Uncle Doctor Paul Abbott, mm-hmm. who is a psychologist who thinks by scaring. Larry will help deal with his emotional issues, but he uses like scare him. 
to, to death. death. So it makes me wonder if he thinks that maybe there uh, he knows about that new will or not. Like, well, Uncle Francis. And they Francis, never really define that. Uncle Francis is there with Aunt Kate when she yeah. tells him that she's changing her will. So yeah, I think Francis Uncle Francis Sr. Francis, Francis Sr. Sr. does know because he's the executor. He's the executor of the will. So he knows. But I think he's also told the well, psychiatrist Paul that yeah. that's what's happening. I think he's been let in on it that way. Okay. They don't they don't tell you that, but like no. when they're having drinks and they're kind of sniping at each yeah, other. Yeah, it's unclear who knows what. Yeah, and that's I, that's deliberate, I think. Yeah, yeah. for sure. It, it helps with the reveal at the end. Yeah, but I mean, I I don't even think that most like all most of those cousins are there to help with Uncle Paul's treatment of mm-hmm. yeah Larry and for the wedding, right? I mean, that's yeah. ostensibly why yes. they're all there is yeah. for the wedding. They're right? all there for the wedding, right? Because I think most of them genuinely genuinely like Larry and and don't didn't wish don't wish him harm at all. They actually want him to get well. Yeah. yeah, and it does seem that way, especially when his fiance joins in on that gag. Yeah. Now I'm going to run the trailer, let everybody catch up, and we will talk some more haunted honeymoon. It should have been the happiest moment of their lives, the night they came home to be married at the house of Great Aunt Kate. But it turned into a I know that one of you is a werewolf. Oh, oh, Harry, all over. (laughs) Someone or something is trying to scare them to death. Now, if anything frightens you, anything at all. You just tell me. Holy baloney, here we go again. I just found Cousin Francis in my bed. Was he wearing a dress? Yes, he was. Just ask him to leave, sir. Tell him you have a headache. Ah! Whatever happens, who knows if any of us shall ever see the morning. They have to be ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. It while you're still healthy. Yes, sir. It's the biggest thrill of my life. You'd think this would frighten me. It's not what you think. Well, it's partly what you think, but wait. Oh, wait. Starring Gene. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. In his most demanding role. Oh, it's so complicated. Haunted Honeymoon. (laughs) I think you can probably tell by the trailer that it is kind of hammy over the top farcical yeah. comedy. Yeah. Which may be a, a big reason why I didn't enjoy this all that much is because I don't really enjoy that type of comedy. No, neither do I. Right? So that may be why I'm, I'm not loving this film. Although I got to actually admire Dom DeLuise's restraint yeah. in this oh, yeah. role because, I mean, he could have really hammed that up. He got he he played it overly dramatic. Didn't really play too hard into that female voice that he was trying to do. No. Like, it was kind of just a softened version yeah. of his own and i'm like that worked that worked really well instead of trying to raise your high high pitch your voice oh yeah, that, yeah most, no, it did work what, really well. what most people try to do when yeah, they comment, like he's got that old lady bit to it oh yeah yeah so i kind of liked his performance i just i you know I, the pieces don't come together for it's me. it's he's his whole Everything kind of says it's kind of a non sequitur most of the time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have much relevance to anything. (laughs) Like they talk, she talks about. I know one of you is a werewolf. It and it's supposed to be part of it, but it doesn't really. Well, yeah, they do out of context. Well, they do explain that. It, part of the family legend yeah. is somebody was bitten in the forest and might have werewolf blood that might have been passed down. 
So it is explained in the movie. It's just really kind of left field. <laughs> yeah, true. Like a lot of things in this yeah. movie. Well, when she comes, when all the family finally gathers and uh, she finally comes down, sliding down the banister. Yes, which I love. <laughs> I love that too. But <laughs> she comes down overly dramatic, and I opened up with that sequence yeah. before I introduced the show, and. You know, she's talking, basically saying that the house used to be a a whore house. (laughs) They fill this house with laughter and sin. Laughter and sin. And then she slides down the banister. (laughs) Yeah. No, and I I enjoyed almost almost every moment that Domi Deloise was on screen. Yeah. There were a couple moments where it's like, again... editing or something where it just didn't seem to fit yeah. in place. Well, even bad Dom DeLuise movies, like I always enjoyed seeing Dom DeLuise on screen. <laughs> didn't really matter. But and that was another great mm-hmm. comedy duo going back to Robin Costello was Dom DeLuise and Burt Reynolds. Oh, yes. I know, right? Yeah. So good. <laughs> uh, it's funny, if we were talking about Dom DeLuise, I'm going Cannibal Run. I have to watch those again. That's yeah. Because right, yeah. they oh, also had Sammy Davis God. and Dean Martin in that one. Well, a we duo. will technically be covering that down the nice. road on the show because that kind of was remade as Rat Race. So Yes. Yeah. Well, wasn't I thought the Rat Race was, oh God, the Great Race or whatever it is. Maybe. I'm going to have to do some more research. Oh, it's a mad, mad, mad. That mad, was, mad. There was a mad, 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 mad world remake, yes. And yeah. that was a very similar idea. Oh, so. see, I thought that was Rat Race. but yeah. I, get, I get There's two confused. cannibals and then an unofficial one as well that had a different title. I think it was yeah, that, Speed Zone or something. Speed Zone, that's yeah. what it was, yeah. That was the unofficial one. So I just remember the two. One was Farrah Fawcett. Who was the other one? There was two girls. And Annette, Annette Finicello. No. It, no, it wasn't. Um, who was it? Where they're just in the the jumpsuits. Yeah, and I don't remember in the Ferrari. I don't remember who that was. Adrian yeah. Barbeau. I think it was. Maybe. I think it was Adrian Barbeau. That's who it was. Yeah. 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 We'll have to get to that. But yeah, that's what I remember. I'm like going, yeah, the girls, come on, go. <laughs> so happy. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's sort of the the werewolf thing. I think it's a little bit. It's extraneous. Yeah. I could see somebody trying to make Aunt Kate go insane so that she dies and that inheritance gets freed up a little sooner. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the death of Francis at the beginning before that reveal of the will change. What is that? Like, what motivates oh, that? I because, still don't know. Oh, uh, because Francis likes to impersonate Aunt Kate. The killer thought he was killing Aunt Kate when he killed Francis oh, Jr. I don't know why that's make why that, that happened. Of course, so they were trying to already get the will moving. Yes, <laughs> before they be, the will be, changed. Before the will changed. Yeah, yeah. and he, he killed Francis Jr. before, and, and then Kate changed the will after the murder. Yeah, so that's, I guess it wasn't clicking in because I was sitting there going, "Fuck this movie." <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's the thing. Like some of it is, it's it the really important details. They just flag up, like they just they blow past them, so yeah. you don't notice, and that's part of the problem. Like I think you kind of you kind of got to act it, like people are stupid and ensure they know what's going on. Yeah, it gets buried in a lot of other dialogue, and there's a lot of talking in this movie. There is, yeah, right. and they I think they could have gone with a lot more of that physical comedy that that we did enjoy the sliding down the banister, the scene mm. that Trish was talking about where Jill Wells on to, on the moose head, which was so much fun when when. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Vicky walks into the room and he's up on the moose head in his underwear yeah. right, and screaming about a snake. And that was genius. With Francis Sr., his yeah. uncle. <laughs> and then at the end, he's like, oh, Uncle Francis, this is my fiance, Vicky Pearl. And he's still on the moose. <laughs> yeah, no, And see, moments like that would show you how good this film could have been. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There were times where like Gene Wilder, as, as Larry there, were, even though he'd been scared out of his pants uh, a moment ago, will just kind of like yep this this is happening now so i'm just gonna go roll with it yeah. and the scene in the basement when he finds the two bodies he's flipping out and the two cops come down and then he's it, well i, I yeah. love that you know, too another well, physical bit a, yeah a, after the thing with fister being really drunk and thinking larry yes. killed these guys <laughs> so he <laughs> larry has fister to, tries to kill him fister tries to kill him so larry knocks him out so now he's in there too and <laughs> These cops come down the stairs just as Larry's about to get out of this. I don't know what this thing is. Oh, actually. it's a it's, it's a, a wood laundry chute or something. No, it's a chute for where you have wood. Okay. When you chop wood outside, you can push it down the chute, and okay. then you have a place, a container that you can go and grab wood to go make your fire. Yeah, okay. like a coal chute or yeah, or wood yeah. Shoot, yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's what this thing is. So he's about to climb out of that when those guys come down. So he comes back in and. 
and it's Fister's legs are kind of hanging over the edge. So yep. I don't know why these guys thought he was sitting because <laughs> like, his legs would have been really tiny. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what made it funny, though. He's but, a radio guy. He could yeah. be deformed. They don't see him on screen. Yeah, so he's he realizes they think he's sitting. So now he's got to play it. and then He's and wearing he, a bathrobe, so he's able to kind of cover it. Yeah, so uh, anytime Fister kind of moves... moves. <laughs> I love when he turns around and punches his sister in the head. <laughs> he beats him on the head with a lock. <laughs> to knock him back out. Uh, it was genius. Like I said, the, the, that scene, it really engaged me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was It was probably one of the more funnier moments in the movie when I... Yeah. It was really hard to even pull a laugh out of me on that movie, but it, that one made me smile, and at it, least. It, it plays into like the cops are like, "Oh my God, you're Larry Abbott!" Yeah, like the one cop is so starstruck, so yeah. he's not paying that much attention. Yeah, but this scene also does identify with part of what made this film not work as well. Is so many of the bits got drawn out too long. Mm. Yeah, right. They, they they could have been shorter. That's true. They the yeah when they do a bit, it's so long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And it's not a long movie. It's like, not. It's no. like just under an hour and a half. Well, maybe that is kind of the problem, because we did have a like an in, like an interesting story, but it's getting overshadowed by the comedy bits rather than the comedy bits supporting the story. Yeah, and you don't really get a chance to know the characters, really. Like, yeah, you know, Larry and Vicky, and kind of actually oddly enough sylvia i know more about than anybody yeah else. and charles who's dating sylvia you don't you kind of just get a sense he's a bit of a dog but oh he is that's and skeevy yeah and I mean, skeevy yeah. but that's you know he's the boisterous one of of the family Out, well, outside of that you don't really get to know much more than that like how did he hook up with Larry's ex. Yeah, and like, why? Right? Why? And is and this she's deliberate? so clearly still in love with Larry. Well, yeah. he talks about jealousy like at the very end of the film. He's like, I'm smarter than Cousin Larry. I'm better looking than Cousin Larry. Like, he's jealous of Cousin so, Larry. I mean, there's obviously, That's why Sylvia's there. Yeah, Sylvia's there's obviously just, a competition in his brain, mm-hmm. but... You don't Larry really, doesn't know about it. You, well, we don't know about it until really in the end of the movie. Exactly. Yeah, right. and yeah there's no there's no hint <laughs> like, towards it. No. And I think that was deliberate because they because they want you to be surprised at the end of the movie. Well, and yeah, they do but a, they don't do a good job of doing misdirection to every on uh, all the people. They they'll make somebody deliberately look creepy, and you think, oh, this that guy. Well, or a voice disguise, and like, oh, maybe it's the this girl. Here's what I'm guessing. And here's another too. I'm guessing you missed the whole bit too, where um, Mon- Mon- Montego the magician has the a huge gambling problem, oh, and no, they're in I've serious noticed. debt. Yes. Yeah. So that was another misdirect. But again, another misdirect. They just blow past exactly. Yeah. It, it, and again, out of context. They don't. It doesn't doesn't get referenced again later. There's no. No, he's just looking just, creepy, and then he has debt. That's all yeah, we really yeah. know. I think if you strengthen the framework that all of the all of his family have, have financial problems, yeah. and want the money, but at the same time they've decided to go on this quote unquote plan to cure Larry, you mm. might have something to go there, and then just have the comedic parts be part of it. Yeah, and Susan shows up fairly late, and I don't know what her thing separately is separately from her husband. Yeah, because yeah, she's married to Montenegro. Yeah. Yeah, again. Right? Yeah, and again, and they did that, ma- that magic trick just inexplicably at the door. I'm going to make my cane float. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Or, he, or my eyes glow. The eyes glowing thing that drove me a bit nuts. I was like, well, they're already talking vampires. Is he, or, or werewolves. Is he a vampire? Yeah. See, so I was thinking, werewolves, vampires, maybe he's a vampire. I don't know. I'd replace a lot of his, <laughs> his creepy magic tricks. With just regular magic tricks and have most of his story be like how he's creating the creepy crap that has to happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, I, I, But he's more affable about his magic. I, yeah. I, I kind I of made him, in, in, my, in my mind, I'm like, oh, he's he's Spider-Man villain Mysterio. <laughs> yeah. To a certain extent, yeah. That's a good way of putting it. No, but he, he could have been a, a very engaging character. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I, I don't want, like, when they do the, the musical number with um, Gilda Radner and Dom DeLuise, I wouldn't have that moment where he's trying to scare Larry. I would, like, have most of it where Larry's getting scared where nobody's around and people like, because he thinks he's going crazy and there's nobody to witness it. Yeah. So he's afraid to tell people. So again, adding to his fears. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wasn't sure that he was trying to scare Larry so much as Larry was having one of his panic attacks. Hmm. That's the, that was the feeling I got from that particular scene is that he was starting to have one of those anxiety attacks. Maybe. Um, yeah. I, he's already I, been scared a couple times. See, again, this, unclar- this yeah. lack of clarity yeah. is a problem. Yeah. yeah. Montego is just scary 
generally. Yeah, it, yeah. that's just his normal persona. Yeah, and I, so Larry should be used to that. Yeah, I, I and I see. I would have liked to see, like as you said, have him be more affable with the rest of the family, and then have that real conflict with Susan. Yeah. yeah, right when they're when they're by, by, by themselves and talking about the gambling debt. Yeah, and right? they made too yeah. much of his family all being creepy. You needed more variety. That's why they were so interchangeable. Like Uncle Francis yeah. was creepy at points. Montego was creepy, and Uncle Oh God, the when the Uncle Paul was yeah. really creepy. Like you don't yeah, need everybody see, to be creepy. And I thought, yeah, I to thought Doctor Paul was going to have a heart attack at any moment. Yeah. He was just looking this, sweaty. Yeah, yeah, this Orson Welles intensity. Yeah, and see, I, th- I and I, I when he first came on screen, I'm like, he, he looked like a nice man. I thought he was going to be the kindly uncle. Right, yeah, and that was kind of the way they sort of cast him too. Originally, he's the one who's trying to help Larry, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. and I would have liked to see him play that kindly uncle. Yeah, right. And but all we see him is the like we're going to scare him yeah. to death. See, but you can play like you can have somebody who might play like a kindly, stern type of uncle. Like he's he's going to be tough but fair. I don't know if that's you know what I mean. Yeah, but he was just more. He seemed like he wanted to scare him to death, like to death, death. <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, the problem, and this is kind of spoiling the reveal at the end, the whole point of some of these, this over exaggerated characters and plot is because they're basically reciting an episode. And so there's a reveal right at the end that this is a radio program that they're actually mm-hmm. in, not this isn't the real thing. Yeah. So. That kind of accounts for some of the over exaggeration. Yeah, but yeah. it's not a well written radio program. We no, need to fix. it's not. Yeah, yeah. It, and it was a device within a device yeah. as well because I mean, based on what we saw, yeah. they were radio hosts playing radio hosts. Yeah, yeah, playing an engaged, yeah, engaged pro- couple. Yeah, problem is you you know right away at the beginning that that's what this is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, because we've already seen them in the radio studio, and you kind of, just based on how people are acting, it just feels like that mm-hmm. old radio thing. Like overdramatic. Overdramaticness. Yeah. 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 A little too much. Yeah. And that yeah. also explain, would explain why Dom DeLuise was playing a female character as well, because it yeah. did happen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very Shakespearean. Yes. Uh- <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's that's actually um, probably pretty accurate, and they probably did that a lot back then. Yeah, and I and I have no objections to the device within a device. I just think that it could have been handled a little more. Yeah, subtly. The, yeah, well, I mean, you need to give the characters a little more motivation, personal motivations. Like there, there was so little time given to that, and more to the gags that mm-hmm. it just every, every you didn't care who was doing it at that point it could have been everybody for all yeah. we and knew. you can't you can if you if you make the gags support the story rather than the other way yeah. around that's what you need because it seems to me there's a, a certain point some of them felt like oh i know what would work, would be cool is if i'm on the moose head and they sort of constructed it around that like you we've all seen these movies where we know that there was like five scenes they wanted to film and just wrote yeah. around that. Every oh, Jackie Chan and, movie ever made. And what was the dude in the werewolf mask that gets it, killed? Completely unnecessary. Who, what was, was that about? He was supposed to be a killer, and I think he was supposed to drive Aunt Kate mad because Aunt Kate thought somebody was a werewolf, and he was dressed as a werewolf to kill Aunt Kate, but actually killed Cousin Francis. It was, but it was a just whole handled thing. so poorly. Yeah. Again, and then, missing details. Right? Yeah, and then somebody kills him, and then and that's we know who that is. Yeah. Now. Yes. Now. Yeah. That's that's Charles. Charles. Yeah. Oh man, this. It, you think it sounds complicated? It's just. It's just stupid. <laughs> yeah, well, it's too. They made it like too complicated when it, it is like it's simple. Like his cousins want the money. Are they really helping to scare him, or are they really trying to kill him? Yeah, you can you can do that, and make a misdirect, and you but you just have to construct it the right way and give enough time to it. Like I think they spent too much time showing them at the radio show and before they show up at the castle. Yeah, they, they well, they were trying to hint that that Susan might be the werewolf because that little dog was always barking at her. Yeah, yeah. but again, it, it, I think the problem too is is we had all these, and this might have been a little bit of self indulgence on Gene Wilder's part, but he had these incredibly long comedic bits that I've already mentioned which seem, seem to go along a little bit longer than they needed to um, mm-hmm. when he could have shortened those by in some cases a couple minutes and given more screen time to these cousins and the rest of the cast establishing their 
interests and motivations and Mm -hmm. really making them characters instead of just these warm bodies on a set. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think about the movie and I, it really is the bits that stand out in my brain. The, the scare thing with the moose and the guy walking down the wall, that whole bedroom scene. That was great. It looked great. Yeah. There, then there's the one in the basement, which we talked about. And And then the one we're trying to bury the bodies. And the bury the body scene. Which was agonizingly long. I'm sorry. It was way too too long. long. Yeah. Do you want to take us through that one? (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah, the burying of the body scenes. Okay, well, at a certain point when they're trying to scare Larry, they've already got Vicky in on it. So she's on this harness outside telling Larry to come outside. Larry comes outside. Then there's like a grave. And then the grave has a hand come out that grabs him. And that freaks him out. And that's how he ends up in the basement with the cops, blah, blah, blah. But past that, he gets out again, finds that the casket is just filled with like this mechanical arm. And... He follows that, finds out that where the lightning and thunder is coming from. Then yeah. somebody hits him and Fister with like a... a yeah, he finds the mongoloid mask. <clears throat> finds the mongoloid mask. Somebody hits him and Fister with a shovel who's dressed as a werewolf. Again, yeah. no reason why. Um, because Fister is putting the two bodies, Cousin Francis and the guy who was originally dressed as the werewolf, in the casket to bury them. Because that's how you butler, I guess. <laughs> well, he's protecting Larry because he's realized that Larry yeah. wasn't the killer. True. And now he's trying to protect Larry. That was very clear. Is that because he's, he, Larry's his favorite. And Larry's always been his favorite. Even though at the beginning of the movie he doesn't remember him. Oh, because he has blackouts, I oh, think. Oh, yeah. And that's just... that. Was, oh, man. That drove me nuts, too. Okay, so his... <laughs> he, sometimes he's hard of hearing. A sometimes he's butler. not. He couldn't remember. and But it never plays more than once. No. It, it doesn't follow. Nothing follows the rule of he three. He has a myriad Larry's. of yeah. symptoms, but they only occur once. Yeah. Yes. So why? Why do you even do it once <laughs> if, yeah. it do, if it's never going to play again? Mm-hmm. Like there's one called um, Murder by Death where it's another sort of big house haunted sort of scary funny movie. Mm-hmm. And, but there, there's one conceit and the butler is blind and that's it. Yes. And that's all they go with. It's a very simple conceit, and that's why they're like a blind butler. What the heck? Yeah, no, and and I think that, that in that, that in our remake, the, the butler does have to have a quirk, but it has to be a single quirk. Yes, mm-hmm. right. That is repeatable. <laughs> yes, and that causes some misunderstandings. Yeah, because yeah. in like Murder by Death, the the butler's blindness causes a misunderstanding because the cook is deaf and mute, and holds up signs for him, <laughs> but he can't communicate with her because he can't see the signs because he's blind. <laughs> Which yeah. is a funny conceit. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that that works better than what worked here. But yeah. and yeah, and you get the old uh, his his is it his wife? Fister's it's his wife? wife, Rachel. Okay, Rachel's his wife, and it's also the maid of the house. Yep. And uh, she's just constantly yelling at him and everybody. He's constantly <laughs> drinking. She's trying. She's she's one of those wives. She's stuck with his old guy. He's doesn't. He's just drinking his whole life. Like he he's downstairs when Larry ends up downstairs in that cellar. Um, Fister's already partway through a bottle. He's hammered. <laughs> That's true. I liked uh, when Larry's talking about the body in the be- in his bed. And, yes. And when he discovers Francis Jr. in his bed as the first scare, which I don't know why they were doing that. But <laughs> See, <laughs> so again. Was Charles was trying to scare him as well. Let's yeah. cure him before we kill him. No, this or- is another one of those. We need to do a comic bit. Yeah. That's going to take forever. Yeah. Yeah. And not fit into the rest of the script. Yes. Because yeah. the only person who knows that Francis Jr. is dead is Charles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So it had to be Charles to put the body in the bed, but why would he do it? Yeah, why would he do that in the first... I no. just... I don't know what that was about. And then he runs out, talks to Fister. He's like, oh, I found Francis, and he, he's in my bed. Well, just ask him to leave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's dressed in Aunt Kate's clothes. Like, just tell him you have a headache, sir. <laughs> just See, it, that's it. That's what told me it was a comedic moment, and it doesn't yeah. really fit. And there was something about, do you know what it's like to be in a bed with a cold body? <laughs> much, <laughs> Every night. <laughs> warm, warm brandy helps. Warm yeah. brandy helps. <laughs> yeah. See, the bit was funny. Didn't fit, though. Yeah. No, and then he goes back in, and then the body's not there. He goes to sleep, and he does that little mantra in his mind that yeah. that his wife uh, or his Oops, fiance. There goes my imagination yeah. again. And Vicky, and yeah, and then of course this guy comes walking down the wall, and I'm <laughs> in a mask. Which is a magician, and he's like, "This should be scaring me, but it's not. Yeah, because I know it's in my head. <laughs> oh, and I, all I have to do is reach out and touch it." 
And he does, but which I, I kind of want to keep this where he's touching it and like he's got his fingers in the nose and you feel, hear those squishy sounds. He's like, ee, ee, ee. <laughs> <laughs> and he puts his fingers in his ears. He's like, ah. Yeah, no, and those are th- th- another great bit, right? And that one did work though. Yes. Right, right? That looked like the Mongoloid from Goonies. <laughs> True. It did. It, yeah, it looked like sloth. Yeah, it totally looked like sloth. <laughs> but yeah, like he's got this one tooth and he's like sticking his fingers all over it like yeah it would gross you out it's funny and i think it should stay in because that's part of the things that's supposed to scare him with yeah it's actually not bad because that's the one standing on the wall and then he bends over and like oh that's actually pretty good see i feel that's that's what all of those comedic moments should have been because that supports the whole scaring him narrative while still being a funny part yes yeah so that and that's kind of where it could have been great and i would have liked to have seen more of those and more of how uh, more behind the scenes stuff Right? Yeah. Where, they're, where they're plotting this stuff um, mm-hmm. to scare him, right? And have yeah. the whole murder mystery sort of happening in the background where you see, where you see it, yeah. but it's not, it's not the core story. Ooh. Or you have ones where, like, well, have you seen Cousin Susan? Oh, I don't know where she went. Like, she's yeah. dead. Yeah, exactly. Like, when they're all gathering, like, okay, so next we're doing this, like, where's... Where's other, you know, where's Cousin Susan? Where's, where's, where's Uncle Francis? Well, I yeah. wanted to see the discussion mm-hmm. with Dr. Paul and, and uh, Vicky because, yeah. you know, he shows up and next thing we know, she's floating by Larry's window in her wedding dress. Yeah. And I'm like, well, we know that he's trying to scare him. So she's obviously been convinced. Mm-hmm. At least that's the way I took it. But I get the feeling we're supposed to think that maybe she got murdered. <laughs> See, yeah, and that like, would be stupid. And, but, and it's stupid, but they don't commit to either direction. And like, well, I'd rather have seen the discussion mm-hmm. or at least something remotely th- that looked maybe threatening that maybe we could think that. And this is where you can do the affable Dr. Paul. Yeah. Where he's like, no, Vicky, we're, do- we're doing this for his own good. Like, mm-hmm. we're trying to help him. If we can just crack him to like the very base of what caused this trauma... We can help him, and you can have a lovely life together. We just need you to do something terrible right now, if that's yeah. all right. <laughs> and, uh, you know what I would have liked to have seen, too, is before the reveal that they're trying to scare him, I would have liked to see some scary things happen, so you don't know that this is actually a plot. That, Ooh, yeah. Right, because yeah. when you hear Haunted Honeymoon, you expect ghosty boo stuff, right? Yeah. But we don't get a lot of that. We get the werewolf, we get the ghost scene, the rest of it's all kind of physical scares. Yeah. Right? So I would have liked to have seen more ghosty boo type of scares. And then they reveal that they're, these are deliberate. Well, the torch Ooh. with the hand and the fingers that went yeah. like that, 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 that kind of ran up and down. Yeah, ran up, but like it was, it was somebody holding a hand that was a torch, but, but it lo- was supposed to be... It uh, never light. does anything. Yeah. Like you, he actually, Larry technically doesn't see it. He kind of catches something in the corner of his eye and it, mm-hmm. nothing moves. And then they move on. Yeah. And like, but... But, 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 but so, yeah, missed I, opportunities. There's, ooh, what was that? <laughs> what we could do, like, rather, like, ditch the whole werewolf thing. Just say, like, our family, oh, fuck yeah. our family has been cursed. And then, like, that's where you can have the creepy stuff happening in the house, but you don't know what's going on. Maybe. Well, maybe, yeah. yeah well, but- she, I mean, you got Aunt Kate with the, this house is cursed. Yes. Yeah. That's it. You, Our fuck. family has been cursed for generations. Yeah. yeah. You could just leave out the shitty werewolf part. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, for being haunted, they don't show much in the way of haunting. Exactly. That's yeah. The, yeah, yeah. And, and, and certainly you, you want it to be unexplained for at least a little while. Yeah. And you can pile on to, like, somebody trying to scare Aunt Kate because they also want her kind of dead. Yeah. yeah well, and that, was, and that was what the werewolf was intended to do. It just wasn't handled all that well. Because that, what fucking hitman uses a werewolf costume? Like, well, seriously. again, the, you pay him just, enough, he'll dress. I guess if that's her fear, they're just trying to give her a heart attack. Well, he's supposed to maybe scare her before he killed I her. I think that maybe he's trying to make people question her sanity, sanity mm-hmm. so that the will could be contested. Ooh, oh, but again, let's use not it. explained. Let's use that. Yeah, <laughs> you could do that. Yeah, yeah, we could add that. That's definitely a lovely little... And then the werewolf twist. would make sense. Yeah. But, yeah, but I don't... I still think the werewolf should go, but making Aunt Kate seem crazy is definitely something that should stay. Yeah. Or, and or, that, or having something, things happen to try and make her crazy. So yeah. you could have two different types of scares going on. One trying to make her crazy and one to 
fix Larry. Yeah. yeah. Right? Well, and, you know, and here, then, here's what I think. Ooh, you could double up with her and Larry together. They're trying to scare Larry, but make Aunt yeah. Kate go crazy. Well, yeah. I think part of the problem with this movie is it's only Charles winds up being the villain mm-hmm. when everybody's got proper motivation to do this. So, okay, Larry should be knocked off, right? This is the character because so now they can share in the wealth. Well, hey, how do you get more wealth out of that share? Let's still start killing off each other. Yeah, no, and there's that's that, my idea. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely some, something that has to be happening. And I like the idea of, of having actually you have three different things happening. Okay, you have them trying to scare Larry to make him better. Mm-hmm. You have somebody trying to make Aunt Kate go insane. Cr- go insane, and then mm-hmm. you have a third party trying to kill Larry. Yes. yes. Right. So it gets really complicated, and they're all overlapping, and they, you could you could have so much fun with the situational comedy where they're almost running into each other. True. Mm-hmm. It could be so much fun. Yeah. Like, and I now, just set up the basement yeah. scare. What are you doing here, yeah. Susan? And yeah. not, not everybody is aware of the changing of the will, so some of them would be motivated to kind of thin the herd a little bit because their share would get bigger. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. Like I think I like the idea of saying you don't know who knows. Yeah. You, and, One and that's person. The killer, you never but know who knows else. what. Everybody else might sincere, like the rest of the people are sincerely trying to help Larry. Yeah, yeah, or sincerely trying to kill him. Yeah, yeah. Right? but you don't right. know who's who. Yeah, so yeah, you could have three different motivations happening there and get some really great comedy. But just make that. it clearer at the and, outset, I and mean, you can do it with more time with the other people, like you were saying. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. You, you never have to know who it is until the very end. Until the very end, right? Yeah. No, I like that, and yeah, a lot more misdirect, and it's a bit of. You know, they wanted to be a whodunit, but by the time you get there, you don't care who done it. <laughs> no. And if you add more where it's it's people and like bumping off other bits of the family, yeah. you can make more use of the big, what I always love about like those old haunted house movie chillers with like the drawing room or like they're in some passageway or something yeah, like, like that. Yeah, right. like secret passageways and stuff like that. It could be so much fun, right? Yeah. Well, they have that in here. It's just, yeah. They're they not used use very well. Them. They don't use it very well. They're like, oh, yeah, maybe this panel opens up and there's a knife comes out and pulls back. and Yeah. Well, they have the brick wall in front of his room and then yeah. all of a sudden the door's open and it's gone. And it's gone. You know, there's some neat things there, but, I, you know, I kind of want to see them work. <laughs> yeah, like you can have a rotating wall. You could do all sorts of fun stuff. Oh, yeah. As as we discussed in, in Abacus Don't Meet Frankenstein, yeah. we love a rotating love wall. love a rotating wall. <laughs> yeah. Or a fireplace. Yes. <laughs> Worked in Indiana Jones. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it did. Yeah, I mean, and the thing, too, is, is I mean, all these people know this house. Yeah. Right? Um, including Larry. Yeah. Right? So, mm-hmm. and that's the tricky part is, is how do you get that? Suspension of disbelief from him. Yeah, especially if you... Knowing full well, he knows that there's there, there's hidden passageways and stuff. Yeah, if you grew up there, especially kids, they touch everything. You're going to they, discover they played, a few played, played in these and used them to scare each other. And right. I mean, there's mm-hmm. another thing that you could go back to is is have a childhood flashback where they're always scaring Larry. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because that could make it a lot more fun is, is they're always scaring Larry. And so then that could play into his... This, I know it's in my head thing yeah. because... He doesn't really believe. He doesn't really believe the scares because. Now let's get to the. Ooh, word. and that can also play into the fact that maybe they feel bad about it. Yeah, yeah we have. Like we haven't level. actually talked about the root of Larry's trauma. Yes. Yes, which gets explained very late in the movie. Yeah, yep, very really. late in the movie. So it's a, it's a dark and stormy night, <laughs> and he's a child. Yes, and his and tie his, is not straight. And his tie is not straight, and his mom is getting married. Yes. On a dark and stormy night as it always is i don't think it's a night it's a day it's a very cloudy day then it's dark <laughs> it's it's dark and stormy time of day Doesn't dark and stormy midday <laughs> it's not nearly as dramatic no, no. <laughs> as as weddings tend to happen lightning comes through the window and she gets struck by she lightning gets struck by lightning i'm assuming she died on the wedding <laughs> at the wedding we don't know. The the flashback ends. Yeah. It just kind of ends right there. Yeah. See, like, I, I can kind of see how they were thinking that because it was a wedding, him getting engaged made his his condition worse. Yeah. And I think you can still kind of keep that idea that it makes his condition worse. But I, I think we need a better... Better trauma. Better trauma. Yeah. yeah. Better trauma. <laughs> like maybe his new stepdad kills his mom on the wedding night. <laughs> 
Yeah, that, maybe. It's going to a dark space, but yeah. That's okay, because my remake does. Nice. <laughs> I, I want to take this a whole lot more seriously. Oh, see, I do not, but that's <laughs> yeah. just me. No, I, I, yeah. We already know my stance on comedies, especially comedies that don't work like this one. So uh. we already gave this one a shot as a comedy. It didn't work, so let's let's go full bore with it. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, and you always do that with tend to do that with the comedies or movies you don't like. It's like I'm just going to change the whole damn thing. Yeah, yep. there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I'm just gonna, well, I I like a lot of it. Yeah. Like I I'm going to keep the radio stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I really like that. I want to keep the setting, you know, of the 30s. It's a it's a time I think is uh, really interesting. So. Well, it's sort of that old stoic gothic house. It seems weird now. Yeah. Like in today, you can even go back to the 80s, but it seems any more current, it seems weird, right? Is it just me? I don't know. Is that like just, old Gothic houses don't feel current. Anymore, yeah. 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 And that's just it. Yeah. They don't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it felt really was, empty. Yeah. It did feel really empty. But, it, but yeah, I think it's just that filmmakers don't go to that unless they're doing like a supernatural horror yeah. period piece. Mm-hmm. Right? And I mean, you have seen some, like that one with. Daniel Radcliffe, the Lady in Black, I think is what it is. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that's like the 1800s. So, yeah. And it's so boring. Yes. So boring. But we're not talking about that movie, sorry. No, no um, we, won't, we never will. Because it's so boring. Because there's no way you can watch it again. <laughs> I can't. There's a sequel. I'm like, I can't do it. There's the a first, sequel? There's, there's a, a sequel. sequel and the first one was so boring. I mean, it's very gothic, but it's so slow. Yes. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with a slow burn as long as it makes sense on the on the way. But that one never did make sense, really. <laughs> no, I never could make heads or tails. And I don't, that movie. I don't mind a slow burn as long as the last ten minutes are batshit insane in a good way. Yeah, yeah. If you give me a really good payoff at the end, I can forgive sitting there yeah. for an hour and a half, going, "Come on, come on, come on." <laughs> See, House of the Devil was batshit crazy at the end, but it was so stupid, I got so angry. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll save that one for for yeah. our thirty one days of horror podcast. But yeah, like if you can, if you really make the payoff where that a slow burn makes the rest of the movie great. Because you remember a really good ending that does it justice. Yeah. yeah. And I'd like to see that happen with this one too, right? Is it have the long setup, right? And then have like a really good payoff at the end yeah. where you don't know who the actual plotters and killers are until th- the last few minutes. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, and with I mean, whoever's left standing. Yeah, yes, exactly. yes, exactly. Some of right. them are going to die now. Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, I love that bit where Charles says, Charles is smarter than Larry. Charles is better looking than Larry. Yeah. Like, it was probably the best part of the best performance part is because it showed that he was really kind of nuts. Yeah. And that played really well to the fact that he, he had gone off the rails and killed his killer, right? Killed the guy yeah. he hired to kill hit people mm-hmm. and started doing it himself because you know what? He's gone beyond any type of morality that was left in it. Yeah. And yeah. The, the part with Vicky in the kitchen where he's talking quote, he's quote unquote talking to the police and then something drops on the floor and Vicky notices that the phone line's been cut. And she stands up to be like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Larry's not the only actor in the family. Yeah. yeah. And so he goes to kill Vicky, and she's like, ah, better take off. <laughs> yeah. right. So, but yeah, I think this movie, ha- like, the core, the, the core story and, and, and concept has great potential. Mm-hmm. Right? Very Clue, Murder by Death, which was a great film. I remember this. When you were telling me, they're telling us about that, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that movie. I remember seeing yeah. that and laughing my ass off. Yeah. Right? Yeah. With because all it was different... smart, funny, right? Yeah. Yeah, bunch of it's still bunch of it's super racist now, but <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the 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 conceit that it was all the people who sold the mystery magazines. And they had to solve a mystery in this this house, and one of like a bunch of them were going to die. That was a great conceit. I loved it. Yeah. So, any uh, final comments on this film before we get into recasting this thing and rethinking it a bit? I I, I love Gilda Radner. I love Gene Wilder, and I, like I say, like th- this could have been great, but like you say. The comedic parts are kind of standalone, and they don't really fit the purpose of the movie. They don't yeah. serve the purpose of the movie. And if you can make that change, it could be fun, a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, you can balance this movie out a little bit better, and then it could be a little more of that goofy... Com- well, it's Who done it? Like, yeah, a little but more with- who done it. I want that balance of humor with what we're seeing, and... You know, something like Shaun of the Dead does that a lot better, yeah. where you have these goofy characters, but in, in a terrible situation. 
And yeah. sometimes you you know there is true peril there. And that's why I picked him as my director. Mm, nice. <laughs> yeah, so, well, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why I smiled exactly. so big when you said it. Cause well, I made sometimes I make the realizations as we record. Yeah. So <laughs> exactly. As as I become more and more unconvinced with my casting, but <laughs> yeah. but it can still work. Yeah. Well, if, if if you've gone more serious, I mean that could be more a lot of fun too. Is it's always fun getting serious actors into comedic roles. Yeah. Yeah. Right? There's. I certainly didn't cast with comedy in mind, yeah. <laughs> but I do have some do. guys that are very capable at it yeah. in my in Oh, my yeah. Casting, there's some so. great dramatic actors that can do both. And they're yeah. Right. Well, let's get into some casting and we'll talk some more about uh, some changes we can make. But I think we've kind of got the skeleton of what we want already there. So, Sam, since right. you've already, we, I, I'm guessing it's going to be Edgar Wright as your director. Oh, yeah. guess what? Right there. <laughs> and you're right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I totally agree. So, I'll be honest. Th- my toughest casting was Larry. Oh, that was definitely my hardest. Yeah, um, uh, but I, I went with Jason Siegel. Mine was oh, uh, nice. mine was re- replacing uh, Gilda Radner was yeah. really hard. Jason um, Siegel is excellent, by the way. Yes, and I didn't try to replace Gilda Radner. Like, you can't, right? You can't do it. Um, but so I went with a, an actress who I know was really good at. That type of comedy um, does both physical and the farcical. I went with Rashida Jones. Mm-hmm. Nice. Because um, I, I really liked her in Community. Not Community. Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec, yes. And then she has that other show. That I can't, I've only seen one episode, and I can't remember where it's, where it's like the it's yeah. very She's like naked a detective gun. or something? Yeah. Very naked gun. It's got a talking dog in it. It's, it, it's really over-the-top comedy. Okay. But again, really good in it. For Aunt Kate, I went with Meatloaf. Nice. <laughs> right, like I, said, I wanted to keep that, and I'm like... <laughs> Yeah, let's go with Meatloaf. Well, he had tits in Fight Club. Yes. Um, for Cousin Charles, I went a little uh, less um, handsome leading man type of, of character because I just wanted to see Patton Oswalt as play Cousin Charles. Ooh. Right? I think, I think he'd play that slightly crazy, and it would explain the rivalry a lot better. I would have done mm-hmm. him as uh, Francis Jr. Well, I, I thought about that too. Actually, I mean, that, that's where I actually where I first thought. I'm like, I'm like no, you know what? I'm going to make him cousin Charles. Um, that's still good. I like it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. For Fister, I went Vince Vaughn because he's huge and he just nice. could play that lurchy type of butler. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that's where where I was really thought what they were trying to do with Fister was trying to give him that. Yeah. lurchy kind of feel but they yeah. just with this one you know, I, I like that I, I wanted to keep that they were old yeah I imagine that he grew up with these people yeah I imagine Vince Vaughn is like a stoner butler I don't yeah. know why <laughs> that could be fun. like that's why he can't remember yeah. stuff <laughs> um, for Sylvia <laughs> um, the ex-girlfriend I'm with Anna Ferris. Nice. Okay. Um, again, because they're all about the right that she's about the right age, and, and mm-hmm. I could see see her taking a smaller role because she's not really working anymore. For Susan, I, I did, went with Elizabeth Banks mm-hmm. because I love Elizabeth Banks and she does great comedy as She's well. She's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For Uncle Paul, I went with Michael McKeon. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, I like that. And I think he could do that kindly uncle oh, sure, yeah. character very well. We've seen, we can, we've always seen him do both sides of that like yeah. we've yeah you know that's good yeah. anything with christopher guest he's great in. Yeah. yes yeah and i almost cast christopher guest but i'm like no you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna do go have a little bit of fun with uncle francis because i did want him to be kind of creepy and a little weird yeah so well I, he's on better call saul <laughs> yeah his, <laughs> mine's his, very his different from yours. yeah and then for um uncle francis i went with christopher walken mm-hmm. because i just wanted the slightly crazy uncle mm-hmm. and then i ca- did cast montego as well because i wanted that more that more of that magic happening and explain better so i went with neil patrick harris Oh, as the magician, nice. because he does do <laughs> magic. I was, I, you know, I did think about that, but I, 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 didn't do it. I was trying to be on that level. But who's a dark magician? And I'm like, ah, that that won't make me roll my eyes. And yeah. I just couldn't find one that I was happy with. So yeah. I, I did cast, but I never wound up being a magician in the yeah. end. So I, that's good. I yeah. like it. And if if we're going with that more affable character, Neil Patrick Harris is perfect for for that. And he can go into that and then have that conflict with Susan's sort of behind the scenes i yeah. think it'd be a lot of fun right nice That's i like great. that well, i'm gonna break up the comedy so i'm gonna go first nice. and then we're gonna end with trish because i always go last exactly <laughs> and if we got two comedies let's bookend me for sure there we go let's bookend with me okay well this could be an action movie as we were talking about earlier <laughs> <laughs> well in my remake and uh, you know i i didn't even come up with the director but that gothic look tim burton does really well but unfortunately even he doesn't do that very well lately so i thought about I, him but i'm like if i could get old like er, younger tim burton go back in the time machine get that tim burton yeah <laughs> bring him here 
So I'm I'm unsure as far as a director, but I, I you know, I'm on board with somebody like Edgar Wright for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, I I I can only pick Guillermo del Toro so many times, so I'm just <laughs> gonna leave him off the list entirely. <laughs> Okay, for my Larry Abbott, because I wanted to go a more serious road, you can, but with some comedic elements, I think we can. I think my cast still works with throwing a balanced bit of humor in there. But um, because I want more kills, I want to bring more horror into the movie. So my Larry Abbott is Sam Rockwell. I wanted oh, somebody nice. who's already played in period movies and. And could do that radio kind of dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and he so does great comedy. He does great comedy too. So, so yeah, I went with Sam Rockwell as my Larry Abbott. Now, my Vicky boy, did I have a tough it's time hard. with Vicky? You know, I had two choices, so I'm going to tell you both because I'm kind of fifty fifty on it. It's Vera Farminga, nice as Vicky, or Jessica Chastain. So. I'm, I'm for the more serious haunted honeymoon. I could see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For my more serious one, and for my aunt Kate, I actually went with a female. But you could still roll up your shoulders and say, "Is she <laughs> Kathy Bates?" Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> um, I I really like the idea of Kathy Bates in that role. I wanted a few horror icons in here, and she's done lots of horror, and she's. Very capable of comedy. And she's so, also like a big personality, which I and, feel Aunt Kate is. Yeah, yes. and very lovable. So mm-hmm. I, I want to see her in that kind of role. So I, I, I totally see her there. Now, it's Invasion of the Remake. I always like to bring somebody in from the original. Unfortunately, so many of them are gone now. Especially, mm-hmm. uh, In fact, your three big leads are all gone. So I brought in Jonathan Price as Dr. Paul Abbott. Okay. So, oh, and nice. he's been so... He can pull off creepy and as that character is but we've also seen him be lovable in pirates so um he and could so be many other things yeah. and yeah, everything they, else yeah. so we were discussing jumping jack flash a long time ago he's an almost not in that movie but yeah. he's so charming yeah so you know when he's being charming you buy into it when he's being a villain he's also very good at that so i i'm like hey all right we'll we'll keep you in <laughs> nice. Oh, man, I had so many different Fisters and Rachels. and For uh, Francis Sr., I went with John Glover. Ooh. <laughs> for Francis Jr., for the short time he's on screen, honestly, I just cast him because he kind of looks like like uh, Roger Aston Griffiths in the original. I uh, put Tony, to- Toby Jones as Francis Jr. Oh, nice. Because <laughs> it just looks like the guy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I, there's a couple of times I'm like, oh, you look like this actor and this person. I'm like, but because I'm going more serious, there's sometimes the casting went out the window when I made an association. And, of course, Fister and Rachel. I didn't actually cast Sylvia. Doesn't matter. I kind of wanted her to be, I wanted to change her up a little bit. And yeah. uh, be the trashy ex girlfriend, mm-hmm. <laughs> and just kind of have her own motivations of trying to get rich by marrying into the family, kind of thing. <laughs> and didn't work with that brother, so let's go to the other brother, right? Yeah. And she's just motivationless in this movie. She she's is just a- there to cause conflict, and with with Vicky, which you can still do. Yeah. So so I'd make her a little less likable, but I don't have anybody for her for. For my fister, I had Tobin Bell because oh, I wanted, okay, I wanted yeah. somebody kind of creepy, but it's still older because they're technically is kind of like his grandparents, right? Yeah. Um, so Saw is what he does with his vacation, <laughs> exactly. Okay. And Judith Roberts is Rachel from Dead Silence, oh. right? <laughs> I know you just watched it, so you, you uh. it totally works, right? <laughs> totally works. I uh, got a couple more here um, for Susan uh, Claudia Black. She was a lot of people will probably remember her from a lot of sci-fi stuff. Oh man, and it's all popping out of my head all at the same time. Stargate TV series she was in that uh, first Riddick movie. Oh. oh. What uh, was she black. in the first Riddick movie? Yeah, yeah, Pitch Black. She was in Pitch Black. She was kind of the mechanic with the dark hair. Okay, oh, no, okay, no, I know she, she is. Yeah. yeah. 
And he's a good, good uh, New Zealand actress. Nice. But she could do American accent just fine. So, and she kind of looks apart it with her black hair. You know, she I, does. When you said, now that I know who she is, I see it. Yeah, with uh, when she has the black hair, I think she's been rocking some blondish kind of thing right lately. But and Montego, I wanted somebody who can pull off a little creepy, probably do that magic stuff, but can be likable at the same time. We've seen him be very menacing as Siler and somewhat likable in Star Trek. Ooh. Zachary Quinto. Nice. So yep. that kind of rounds out my cast. Now, if we kind of go that more balanced comedy horror, this cast still kind of works, thank God. Yes. Because <laughs> I wasn't mm. thinking, I was thinking more hardcore horror, but I'm kind of more leaning towards the comedy horror that we've kind of worked out the balance a little bit better on. So um, my cast still works. <laughs> your cast does still work, yeah. Because yeah, I've been fortunate in the few horror comedies I've watched for 31 Days of Horror, which we'll talk about later. Um, mm-hmm. I've been very Deep. fortunate they've been yeah. enjoyable. Yeah. 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 Because there are some really bad ones out there. Oh, there's oh, yeah. some, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's some bad ones. Okay, Trish, let's get to your casting. Okay, I went a different way with this because I thought I could add yet another layer of what's going on in this this movie. Excellent. So, I was struggling with my Larry Abbott until I decided to go a different way. My Larry Abbott is actually Donald Glover. Oh, okay. All right. Donald Glover is one of the adopted children <laughs> who's there, which again adds to why people want it off. I'm like, why is he adopted kid? And there's also more adopted children. So it really messes everything up. Okay. And Vicky Pearl, Abby Jacobson. Mm-hmm. She's one of the leads of Broad City. I if don't know that, that show. No. She's kind of young, but I could see them as a young couple ready to embark on their life together. Okay. Aunt Kate. Now, I had two options here. I'm not quite sure which one I want. I, 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 when you're talking about like casting a woman in the part, I'm like, ooh, Kathleen Turner. <laughs> She's old enough now. <laughs> she could be great Aunt Kate. Yeah, 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 totally. Or I went a completely different way. If you Nick- can get her out of retirement. <laughs> yeah, if we could get Nick Offerman. <laughs> into a dress we both went to parks and rec for our casting we did we did um uncle francis i put charles dance okay and for charles uh mark duplass who i just seen in creep and creeps me out and i'm like so he can do creepy but he's also funny in the mindy project so i put i know he's no yeah i put mindy kaling as sylvia Uh, okay (laughs) because she's brash and she's loud and she's buxom and i'm like mindy kaling okay For Susan, like Montenegro, I've got Keegan Michael Key. Okay. And why? Because I think he's he's very funny. He's very affable. Also, I just like he's got that magician y hand. I think he can pull off a magician y look. Okay. A lot of hand gestures. Yes. (laughs) He's (laughs) got magician y hands. You're making a lot of hand gestures. He's got magician y hands in my head. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And Susan is Chelsea Peretti. Oh, nice. Because I feel that they would be a good match. Yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah, they would. Okay, and Cousin Francis, I don't know. I have Jordan Peele as Cousin Francis. Interesting. Because yeah. I kind of want him alive a little bit longer in my remake before he dies. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind him being have at least a wee bit of interaction with somebody in the exactly. movie instead of hanging out of a window in the and intro. And I want it to be sort of um, a mystery whether he's been killed because he's dressed up as Aunt Kate or... Or because somebody's taking him out because he's another such part of the the will money that they're not going to get. Yeah. So yeah. you can have that on there. Dr. Uncle Paul is what I put. <laughs> Donald Sutherland. Nice. Because he's old enough to do it. He was actually on my list as for, for Uncle Paul, actually. I was doing the one. Hmm, Donald Sutherland. Like, no, I want, I want to go with a comedic actor. Like somebody who's, a, who's got a, like a long history of comedy and that's why i went with mckeon but it was down to those two for me every time i deal with the big cast that are you know that ha- are related to each other in the in the story so, you know like if i would have gone with him then i'm like well shit now i gotta do key for sutherland is charles yeah <laughs> like no. gotta keep it in the family they don't always have to be together and then aunt nora who is a paul's wife i had to look that up because she has like one line she's phyllis from the office but her name is Phil. I think I have Phyllis Simpson. I think here, or Phyllis Simon. I wrote it down bad, but I think she looks exactly like the woman, and she'd be a great match. <laughs> Fair enough. For Fister, I have Rory McCann. Okay. The Hound on Game of Thrones. Okay. Okay. For Rachel Fister's wife, I have Shirley Henderson. 
She's been in Train Spotting and Bridget Jones's Diary and uh-huh. The Young Poisoner's Hand. No, she wasn't in The Young Poisoner's Handbook, but yeah, like she's like a very petite little British actress, but she's also old enough. I she could right. the, you age her with a bit of makeup, she could still be old enough. Nice. So, and that is my my casting, and I wasn't sure for a director. I thought of Edgar Wright. I didn't write that one down. I was still struggling with it right before right. but I like the idea of Edgar Wright to do it as a comedy. Yeah, if you're going to do the comedy horror kind of thing, he really does have it pretty pat. And he's good at A and B stories as well. Like yeah. when we're yeah. talking about adding more levels to this, he can do that and not have it detract from the overall story. Yeah, he tends to have fairly large character casts for his movies. Like there's a lot of people floating around Shaun of the Dead and World's End and uh It and never you, feels bloated. No, and you always get a sense of who they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. And you really need that in order to make this work. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, Hot Fuzz has a lot of the misdirects that this needs. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, that was a great example. That's a great example of, of, of how, how it could work really well. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, so he's he's kind of already done it. <laughs> yeah. Well, then he has to do this now. <laughs> Gun pointed at head. Go do it. <laughs> well, no, no, we'll just sit down and convince him. We'll okay. buy him. <laughs> we'll take him out, give him cake. It'll be fine. <laughs> Nobody turns it down apart for cake. cake. No. <laughs> it's cake. Or pie if he wants pie. It's Thanksgiving in Christmas time. You're offering up pie. Yeah, pie. Pumpkin pie. It's pumpkin awesome. Pie. And a good cuppa. Yeah. Yeah, we're not going to mess up his tea. <laughs> well, no. I, I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, me too, actually. I didn't have lunch. This is probably why this is happening now. <laughs> I'm not I'm not hungry. I had a nice big breakfast. <laughs> I like all three casts. They all have potential, right? I mean, yeah. I yeah. mean, and we could even mix up those casts because there's lots, oh, for sure, um, uh, lots of crossover there that could work. Yeah, I think they're all pretty good casts. Yeah, I like for... the idea of a proper magician. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I told. I was. Yeah, I totally wanted a real magician in there. I just. I couldn't think of one that fit properly. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll still put Keegan Michael Key somewhere in my cast. Yeah. Well, you have to. I, I saw him in another horror comedy recently, and. He may have been the best part of the movie. And it, I mean, it was a fun movie. Boy, was yeah. it fun. But it wasn't good, but it was fun. <laughs> He's talented. He's so talented. Now, we keep referencing all these horror, or these horror movies that we've been watching. And for us here on, during this recording, it's still October. And we've been doing a horror movie a day. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and hopefully we'll total 31 we'll see sam's also in the middle of a move but he's working his damn just to try to get ahead so he can match up with the rest of us i think he's only a few away I only yeah. few, as of this recording i only need to watch three more in eight days yeah nice so yeah it looks like sam is definitely wants to be part of that podcast now you may have already heard it because i'm gonna try to get that out as soon as possible for november so what i'm saying now you'll be like well well, i've heard it so shut up (laughs) (laughs) but yes we've 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 been watching all these movies and you will either have heard it already or it is coming very soon yes Yes. or maybe you flip the two episodes you're listening to you might have listened to this one first and gone back to our halloween one so it might be in the right order yes i don't know could be yeah but it's certainly it it is coloring our conversations right now particularly in mine because there's some of them are sitting in my head really well as as they come up in context of what we're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yes, ninety three movies <laughs> in one episode. Holy cow! There might I, be some overlap. But... I, I hope you enjoyed it because <laughs> we haven't had the conversation yet. <laughs> if not, I can tell you right now, still enjoying doing it. It's been, there's a couple times it's been a tough haul, but I've had mostly good movies. So yeah, I gotta say, well, no, I'll save it for the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not going to talk about specifics, but yeah, it's I will say that there was a hump that I had to get over to, at one point there, but I'm now on the downside of it. Obviously, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so for this one, no werewolf, werewolf. I think no that's werewolf. a big one. Hitman, hitman at all? Should we just no. nix the hitman entirely? Well, the werewolf is the reason for the hitman, so both of them go. Both yeah. of them go. I like the idea of just having this legendary curse on the house and kind of building up from from there as mm-hmm. trying to scare Aunt Kate. A couple people are motivated by... for Everybody's motivated by different reasons. Some just want their portion of the will and trying to thin out the competition. Others mm-hmm. are aware of the change in the will. And that's why they're trying to knock off Larry. Where and then there's some who are trying to help Larry, but you know it's all scary. You don't know <laughs> for who poor is Larry. Who? 
yeah, you don't know who is who. And I'd like to add the little bit of there is an actual haunting in in the mansion. Yeah. Because there are some, some things in this movie that like the hand on for the torch in the basement. Yeah. Like, it didn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. It's sort of, yeah, there's a lot of set pieces that don't gel together, but I want it to be. Yeah. Like- and if you have a haunting, it does. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be a malevolent one. No, no it could be something they're used to, and they're they're like, "Oh, hi, yeah. Bill!" Right? I mean, it, you could have a little fun with the fact. Yeah, that I'm not scares saying aren't all that scary. Yeah, I'm not saying yeah. go really serious and creepy with the ghosts like in Crimson Peak, but yeah. just uh, you know, have it there. It, maybe it's helpful at times. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Yeah, like just have somebody's unpacking, and then yeah. the ghost like unpacks something else. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's a prankster. Else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like it was some sort of other all long gone. Like just have an old gothic painting, some yeah. long gone great uncle that everybody thought was evil, but it really wasn't. Yeah, or maybe maybe the ghost is responsible for a a death. And it feels bad. <laughs> well, no, maybe the the ghost is responsible for a death um, during the movie Ooh. and it's actually helping not hurting but again it's another misdirect motivation he saves larry yeah, yeah. saves larry so you know it's actually somebody who's trying to harm larry or somebody else and we'll just say larry for argument's sake because he's the central character because everybody likes larry yeah right? including except, the ghost including the ghost the only one who doesn't is charles yeah, yeah. so and also even, the sponsor of their program even though it looks yeah. malevolent at the time it's actually a, mm. It's actually trying to help and protect Larry. Nice. Oh, that makes me happy. I like that ad. Yeah. Cool. All right. That I'm makes all. me warm. This movie's going to be longer. <laughs> it's going to be longer. It's going to be. I don't think it has to be too much longer. No. If you if you shorten the gags, you got some room yeah. to play yeah. with. But um, I, I figure another fifteen minutes is about yeah. all we really yeah. need. Oh yeah. Just to handle all the all, all the additional layers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, this one's only like an As, hour and a half. 15 yeah. It's, minutes. it's just shy of an hour and a half. So. Still you know, under you, two hours. Getting yeah. an hour 40, so, hour yeah, 45, you're still okay. Yeah, so it's not an extra, a, a ton. It's still keeping it under two hours, which is perfectly reasonable for a horror comedy. So Yeah. Perfectly reasonable, yeah. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm pretty I'm pretty happy with the, the structure on this sucker. What else you get? You guys got anything else you want to add to this thing? No, no. I mean, I think we really covered it. Yeah. I, I was not worried that we'd come up with a good remake, and that's the, the 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 challenge for every time we do one of these movies is when we watch a movie that we don't like, we suffer through them and go, oh, I really hated that movie. But we they always end up sort of with the best remakes. Yeah, well, mm. try to yeah, and it's like, how do I make this into a movie I do want to see? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're getting better. It's it's at finding like there's always a nugget. There's a nugget mm. somewhere that you just have to find. Hey, uh, we pulled it off with Hard Rock Zombies. We can do it with anything. Exactly. True. True. Although you and I did not pull it off with Peeping Tom. Peeping Tom. No, there was no way. But it's too damn good. Yeah, you, that's you were the thing. you were always going to come out with an inferior product on yeah, that. Yeah, no question. Say, same with one over flew over the cookies nest. It was always going to be an inferior remake. So I'll just have some fun with it. See, and that's the, that's the thing. Like with the Gene Wilder movies, that's kind of why I went with Haunted Honeymoon. Like, there's more beloved ones I have, but this yeah. one was one that has that that room. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting ideas in here and i still want to keep the the radio thing and and the fact that the whole thing is a radio play Mm -hmm. and then you break to the characters in the studio and then they're off to their wedding after after it all plays out but it's a good radio play instead of a shitty one yeah and see the the thing is too is it seems to me there was like a radio play within a radio play because yes and that's why the musical numbers in there yeah because oftentimes those old time radio shows were breaking up with a musical act to mm-hmm. give the actors a little time to breathe and and uh, you know go over their scripts and set up whatever they needed to set up because yeah. it was also live yeah and i had no objections to the musical numbers in there yeah. <laughs> surprisingly enough that, that, that those did not bother me they were only now i would make it more a half, of a but... ballroom mm-hmm. dance thing you know instead of mm-hmm. just two characters because it is it's a wedding so let's have one of more extravagant things in a ballroom you know yeah. Everything, everything in this house was so creepy all the time. Like there should have been one of those kind of party areas. Yeah, or maybe have it like it starts off as uh, Montego the magician entertaining everybody, transforms into a musical number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's lots of potential there. Hey, was Susan his like supposed to be his assistant? Like they arrived. She was his separately. wife. I know they're, but 
you know, I, I, I don't know. Like, you could they're, add they're that. obviously estranged, but yeah, I'd give her more to do because she kind of shows up. To, so, oh yeah, we know nothing about Susan. No, no there's we know absolutely nothing, and that was my one of my big beefs. Yeah, the dog all, barks at her. That's it. Yeah, she I could know. be a werewolf. Yeah. <laughs> and you can do so much with Susan, like you know, with all of the characters. They, they 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 were so underutilized. And again, be, it, because it really was uh, in, in talking about it, you realize that it really was a vanity project for Jim Wilder for him to showcase his comedic talents and his bits. Yeah. Which is funny mm-hmm. because, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm not talking bad about the man, but I am a little bit. It's funny because Gene Wilder was, was a dramatic actor and didn't even want to do comedy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. until I I think it was actually Mel Brooks who talked him into it for yeah. Young Frankenstein. And I think that's where the Mel Brooks's influence actually hurts this movie. Like mm-hmm. you can see a lot of the Mel Brooks kind of humor that he'd done so many times within this script. But the thing with like the Mel Brooks humor is he do put in the humorous bits, but I never feel I'm getting blown past plot point. No, and in this one, you're Mel Brooks is very consistent point. with what he's trying to do in tone. And this mm-hmm. one just it was it really wasn't and and it's it's unfortunate because I think it probably really hurt Gene Wilder yeah. the, the massive failure that this was. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, a first and last attempt at directing. Yeah. Um, I mean, and that's a general conceit so many actors have as well. I, I'm an actor; I can direct too, and so many of them can't. Yeah. Right. This is a very select group of, of of actors who actually are competent as directors as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can think of three or four maybe off the yeah. top of my head. Yeah, and and maybe given time, you know, he, I think maybe maybe gave up too quickly, but uh, he should have started smaller, maybe do direct some television to get well, some chops, right? And that's the thing. I think it's sort of some of the actors that got really good at directing. Their first feature wasn't they were weren't trying to do too much at once. Yeah, they went with more of a simpler story to give him more texture, and then you yeah. sort of learn from that. You can't go out the gate trying to jam a whole bunch of stuff in. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, it's got it's built around three big gags, and the movie itself feels empty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the sets pieces are empty, but even just in the script, it feels empty. Like the whole feel of the movie is empty. But what's weird is like the people playing the parts are so full of life, but mm-hmm. the whole st- the movie feels empty. I get it's the so feeling exciting. the movie was fun to make. Oh, for sure. At least for some people, I don't know. Like some people didn't have dialogue, so yeah, <laughs> they just or, stood there with their glowering eyes. Yeah, very, very little dialogue for some of them. And again, now I mean, we talked about it right at the beginning. That was my biggest beef: is they had all these characters that had, with so much potential yeah. that didn't get used. Mm. Yeah, but I think we've we've addressed that. Yeah, I, mean, I, th- I think that we certainly have. Yes. Yeah, we've made we've made the change that needed to be made. Is you can't just focus on the comic those uh, like the slapstick gags. Once yeah. you pad it out and just have the gags support the story, you're all good. Yeah. Well, uh, later on this month, I'm not exactly sure where it's going to fall, but one more tribute to Gene Wilder. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think most people know what that's going to be. The childhood favorite, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, is coming up this month, so look out for that. It might be right after this episode, it might be a little later. I don't know, because there's moving and all sorts of things going on Mm -hmm. right now. So we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, but it will definitely be later this month. The so. rowers keep on rowing and they show so not, no sign of slowing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking about some of the, the tones and how creepy that movie can actually be. And whether or not Charlie's a serial killer <laughs> to be continued on another episode of Invasion of the Remake. <laughs> Old timey. Old timey yes. wimey. <laughs> Brought to you by. Purina Brought to you dog. by Colgate. <laughs> and Purina Dog Chow. The Chow Dogs Love. And enjoy Flavor Smokes, the flavor that keeps on giving while it gives you cancer. <laughs> I'm so not doing voices. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. It was your turn. We it was my turn. I just, I'm not as spontaneous as you guys, apparently. <laughs> no. I already have a radio voice, I don't need to fake it. <laughs> okay, so next time we just have to give you copy. Exactly. Give me oh, copy okay. and I'm okay. just fine. All oh, right. God, we got to start writing for this show? <laughs> well, you know, if we know what we, we got to do at the end, it's like, okay, we need oldie timey radio dags. Here's yours. <laughs> just do it for Sam. Yep. There you go. Yeah, no. Okay, well, speaking of old time radio, I mean, I'm a big fan. Trish is a big fan. Sam knows about it yeah <laughs> um i would like to know what our audience i was a big shadow fan and i like jack benny and abba costello and 
I guess they didn't do too much radio, but they that was they they started with radio as well. So exactly. their bits work with radio. So I mean, I like a lot of that suspense. My God, suspense! There was a ton of those. Yeah. So lots of good to- old time radio. What's yours? What is your favorite old time radio that? you'd actually like to see as a movie. Ooh. I want us to know what, what old-time radio show you'd like to see as a movie. So tell us on Twitter, at Invasion Remake, Facebook, Invasion of the Remake, of course, on Facebook, and Invasion of the Remake at gmail.com. You can do us a big favor if you'd like our little internet radio show. Mm-hmm. You can go to iTunes, give us five-star rating and a short review that really helps us out if you leave ratings you leave reviews it helps us get featured maybe on the pages that we get it ups our ranks Mm -hmm. as well so be vocal and tell people what you like or even dislike you know because we can learn from that as well so write us a review leave a rating and be sure to tell your friends tell five ten friends if you see us post on any of our social media and you dig what we're doing don't just like it but repost it retweet it whatever mm-hmm. it that again helps us out and gets more earballs ear on it on the show earballs i'm gonna have to sketch out what an earball looks <laughs> get like get those earballs well that's a horror movie it that we a- could do <laughs> Oh, what? we'll have to do that one day and just create that movie from scratch earballs the movie earballs yeah that could be fun that could be fun. That could be fun. We might, maybe we'll do that as a live show. He thought he could hear everything. He thought he could see everything. Now he can see, hear everything. Earballs. <laughs> Rolling into theaters near you. <laughs> <laughs> Complete with smell vision Yes. Um, if you guys uh, want to tell your friends about the show and they can't find us, of course, as I said, we're on iTunes. We're also on Google Play. We're on Player FM, we're on Stitcher, Audio Boom, Blueberry, a- any Libsyn, of course, Libsyn, that is our host site, so mm-hmm. Libsyn. Tell everybody where to find us, and, and you know, check the podcast app you like, because we are on pretty much every decent podcast serving app that you can find. So, if we're not on the app that uh, you use, let us know. Well, of course, if you aren't listening to us, then you can't, so... Uh, but hey, we're <laughs> we're also on YouTube. Some episodes are going to stay up, some won't. Um, I'm kind of keeping a selection over there, so some episodes will be only up there for a short time. So mm-hmm. if you're listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to us on one of your favorite podcast providers because YouTube's a terrible way to listen to us anyway. Mm-hmm. We're not a visual show, and we're we're quite long. So you know, you listen to us on your commute and uh, subscribe exactly. to us through Stitcher or one of those podcast apps I just listed because it is a much better way to listen to us is in your earballs. Yes, and like yes. with other than YouTube, you can take us with you. That's right. So you know, YouTube will be there, but uh, not everything's going to be there. The entire libraries are going to be up on those other providers. So you know, and with without editing restrictions that YouTube also likes to shove down my throat. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> which is why some some of the episodes will be only there temporarily, is because. Eh, some asshole tried to flag it and try to make money off my hard work and mm-hmm. screw that guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. Fuck him. Right. Fuck him. <laughs> exactly. All right. So, well, I think that is it for Haunted Honeymoon. I've been Jason. I've been Sam. And I've been Trish. And we're going to go watch a good movie now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll rewatch this. <laughs> <laughs> we're out of here. <laughs> Whoa. for now. Night. Night, Mr. Abbott. Good night. Nice you boys drop by. Murderer! That was phony. Murderer! Murderer.